So, this might be one of the very few educational games out there which makes reference to a substance so incredibly powerful it could take out an entire city. I'd make a joke about this, but quite frankly, since the game was intended for older children and teenagers, I think I can let it slide. Now, before we get started today, I want to quickly mention that the only game to come out of the learning company which I have any nostalgia for is Treasure Mountain, as I've never actually played any of their other releases as a kid. Just something to keep in mind while I take a look at today's ancient DOS game, Operation Neptune. This game is unusual in that most math-based edutainment is aimed at young children, but this game is specifically aimed towards late childhood and early teens. Meaning even as an adult, the math in this can be surprisingly challenging, and in fact, some of it is impossible without the aid of a calculator able to perform fractions. It's something the game actually provides itself. And curiously, while this game is fairly straightforward, it does have a critical flaw, which makes it more frustrating than it needs to be. Though this flaw can be adapted to, at least partly, and we'll definitely be talking about it later in the episode. The math problems it provides are actually pretty clever, though the variety in answers can be a bit limiting in some cases. And with the game taking three hours to beat from start to finish, you'll likely have some of the potential answers to certain problems memorized before the game's over with. All that said though, most of this program is word problems with visual aids, making it very interesting to play through to see what kind of new imagery the game will throw your way as you go along. Operation Neptune was created and released by The Learning Company in 1991 and is a one-player action-slash-edutainment game. I should quickly point out that some people occasionally confuse this game as being part of the Super Solver series of games produced by The Learning Company, but it actually has no relation whatsoever to their Super Solver character, as they primarily use that character for edutainment games aimed towards younger children. It supports CGA 4 color, Tandy 16 color, EGA 16 color, and MCGA 256 color graphics, all running at 320 by 200 resolution, and also supports PC speaker, Tandy 3 voice, Roland MT32, and AdLib sound devices. The box claims to support Sound Blaster, but in actuality, none of the sound in this game is digitized, so Sound Blaster support simply plays back the AdLib sound and music. That said, every sound mode sounds very different from the others, so there's not really any one particular sound mode which is optimal. Instead, I recommend trying each when playing through DOSBox and seeing which you like the most. This can be done by altering the DOSBox config settings, or you can also manually set certain sound modes with command line switches when starting the game. As for its current release date, it's still commercial, and while I believe the learning company used to sell this game online many years ago, it hasn't been available for quite some time now. That said, if you go searching places like Amazon and eBay, you'll find plenty of copies available, ranging in price from dirt cheap to as much as $20. Interestingly enough, whether or not you find the CD-ROM version or the floppy disk version doesn't seem to be a factor in how much it's going to cost. One thing to keep in mind though is that there's actually an old Atari ST game by the exact same name which has absolutely nothing to do with this game. So try not to get the two confused if you go looking for either.
an edutainment game with a story? Well, surprisingly, yeah, this game has an overarching story to it. Basically, it takes place in some sort of future where two space missions are being conducted, one on an asteroid, another on a planet. Both teams discovered very interesting things and collaborated to produce a space capsule to send back to Earth with their findings, as well as some of the things that they had uncovered. There's just one problem. When the space capsule reached Earth, it had a rather shaky re-entry, and not only split in two, but crashed into two separate parts of the ocean, creating a potential toxicological nightmare, and as the capsule was made of metals, which could cause widespread pollution to the ocean if not cleaned up as soon as possible. Fortunately, there was already a contingency plan in place for just such an emergency, dubbed Operation Neptune, the goal being to use a special submarine to pilot beneath the ocean and collect all of the fragments of the space capsules so they can't cause widespread harm to the ocean environment. At the same time, you must also uncover data fragments from the logs of the astronauts to figure out what potential dangers may await you when you reach the special cargo carried by each section of the space capsule. So, what does any of this have to do with mathematics? Well... Most of the gameplay in Operation Neptune takes place here, moving around the ocean in your sub. Your goal in each sector is to find all the space capsule pieces detected in the area and recover the data capsule containing the log entry. You must then reach the supply station at the end of the sector to resupply and enter the next. Before you start though, you get a choice between two skill levels. Though it's interesting to note that this is actually more a choice between two different sets of levels, with the Expert set being more challenging overall than the Voyager set. The math aspect comes into play seemingly at random, though there's actually triggers for each math event that you come across. When a math event is triggered, a light will flash on your sub and one of the indicators at the bottom will light up, indicating if the math question is being requested by the boat on the surface, which is tracking your condition, or if it's being generated by your onboard computer system, which kind of gives you a vague idea of what kind of question you may be faced with before it appears. You must then answer the math problem in order to continue, though you'll also be allowed to continue if you get it wrong twice and still have oxygen left. Now, oxygen is how you stay alive underwater, which <laughs> may seem obvious, except it acts more like a life counter than an air meter. Essentially, the gauge shows how many extra oxygen tanks you have and how much oxygen is left in the current tank. When you take a hit, you lose one quarter of the oxygen in the current tank. If you run out of oxygen, you return to an earlier point in the level, depending on what space capsule pieces you've collected. If you lose all of your oxygen, you restart the level entirely and have to collect everything all over again. You also have ink pellets you can shoot to temporarily stun sea creatures so that you can pass by them without losing oxygen, though if you do take a hit, there'll be a fairly sizable moment of invulnerability that you can take advantage of. And trust me, you're going to be taking a lot of hits. See, here's the frustrating thing about this game. The controls. They are just plain bad. Your sub has an immense amount of floatiness as you attempt to move it around, making it very difficult to maneuver the thing exactly where you want it to go. Whereas some of the sea creatures you're expected to dodge can move lightning quick. Naturally, you'd think, okay, just shoot ink pellets and be done with it. But even this aspect is unreliable, as normally the pellets go straight forwards, but if you move up or down for a brief period of time and then shoot, you'll have an up or down slant on your shots, made more confusing by there being no visual indication when this will happen. Now your sub pretty much immediately points up or down to show movement up or down, but if you only just started moving this way, your shots will still go straight forwards, despite looking like they'll be shot at an angle. To make this even worse, once you get some speed going, it's not possible to turn around instantly, meaning you can't shoot behind you until you slow down first. Plus, if you try to turn around but only tap the movement button instead of holding it down, you may actually snap back to the direction you were originally facing. To top off this entire thing, it's very difficult to tell where the solid walls are, and you'll often end up getting stuck on wall surfaces which don't even look remotely solid, as the instant you hit something solid, your speed is immediately cut to zero. Essentially, controlling your sub is exceedingly difficult in this game and is otherwise the only major issue you'll encounter. 
The math problems themselves can actually be set to varying levels of difficulty. Whether you want to deal with just whole numbers, decimals, fractions, or all three of them. Many of the problems require some extended thought and multiple steps to complete, and while there's always a visual component with each problem, sometimes you actually need to use that visual component to gauge what you need to put in. The game fortunately has a built-in calculator function, which is pretty much required if you want any hope of getting through this game. You can turn the calculator functionality off, but then this just means you'd have to do everything the hard way on paper with long division and whatnot, or using your own calculator, and there's really only a handful of questions which can be answered reliably without using calculator functions. Fortunately, the game isn't completely merciless in this regards. Unless explicitly stated in the question itself, you can express any answer however you prefer, either as a fraction or with a decimal value. Although, inputting fractions can be a bit tricky, as you first have to type in the whole number, then press F to engage fraction writing, then type in the numerator, then a slash, then the denominator. Actually, as a whole, a calculator can be a bit tricky since you need to use the equals key on the keyboard to get the answer to what you input, because if you hit the enter key, you'll actually submit what's on your calculator as the answer to the current question, which could lose you some oxygen if you get it wrong. The game does some rather tricky things too as you progress along. For instance, there's friendly dolphins in many of the levels which provide you with an oxygen tank if you can catch up to them before they leave the screen. However, they move very quickly, and unless you know ahead of time exactly where they are, and are already moving as fast as you can, you're probably going to miss them. Not to mention, unless you already have a full tank of oxygen, they simply refill your current tank instead of giving you a brand new one for your reserves. Fortunately, if you have less than two spare tanks in reserve each time you start a new level, you're automatically brought back up to two spare tanks. And at the end of each level, you need to move into the supply station. This can't be done until you've collected everything you needed to collect, and you'll get a message about what's missing if you did miss anything. Otherwise, you simply have to pass a puzzle involving rotating locks and you're good to move on. There's a total of five zones, three sectors in each zone, making for 15 levels, and two different level sets, making for a total of 30 levels, not counting the final sectors for each level set as they're a bit special. The final sector for the Voyager set has you dodge a few invulnerable, insta-kill enemies to collect an item, then you have to dodge them a second time going back up to the surface. They're not so bad, really. The really bad part is the final sector for the Expert set, as you have to dodge invulnerable, insta-kill sharks with some very tricky swimming patterns to adapt to, and you have to go through quite a few screens before finally reaching what you're looking for. I mean, seriously, I spent 12 minutes trying to get through all of this, mostly in part due to how bad the sub-controls are. Overall, Operation Neptune is fun for sure, but much more difficult than most math software. Not just in terms of math problems, but also in terms of just moving around. Still, I'd rank it higher than many edutainment titles, though its high level of difficulty means it's not really suitable for introducing one's young children to, and by the time they're in their teens, they may not care about an old DOS game like this anymore. I think by this point, the main reason to get this game at all is for sake of collecting or nostalgia. Beyond that, despite the game being good for what it is, I wouldn't generally recommend people go and play this thing, since it takes a special kind of person to really appreciate what it's become nowadays. Setting this game up in DOSBox is a no-brainer. Just leave Cycle set to auto and you should be good. Also keep in mind that if you decide to play with other graphics and sound supports other than the defaults of MCGA and MT32, you'll need to either adjust the DOSBox config settings to disable these things, or use command line arguments to explicitly define which devices to use. Anywho, that's all for today's episode of Ancient DOS Games. Next Saturday is episode 185, and I'm going to be taking a look at a game which, quite frankly, isn't really all that educational. Unless you count anything to do with Rube Goldberg as educational. Yeah, I'm pretty sure many of you know what I'm talking about, so be sure to send your guests in as soon as you can to adg at pixelships.com, and stay tuned as we continue on with Edutainment Month. <laughs>